Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's hearing. Today we're going to continue hearing evidence from Dr Smith, uh, formerly of the Building Research Establishment. So would you ask Dr Smith to come in, please? Good morning, Dr Smith. Good morning. Are you ready to carry on? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, Mr. Bennett. Yes, Mr. Chairman, good morning. Good morning to you. Good morning to members of the panel. Dr. Smith, good morning to you. Now, on Thursday evening when we broke, we were looking at the literature review at BRE 401353. If we can please have that back up. You'll recall we were in this document, I think. Yes. Yes. Can we please look at page <coughs> at 14? In fact, start at the bottom of page 13, where you see external surface. And that says, provisions are made in ADB to restrict the combustibility of external walls of buildings that are less than 1,000 millimetres from the relevant boundary. This is in order to reduce the surface's susceptibility to ignition from an external source, e.g. an adjacent building. And then if you go over the page, in the first paragraph there, it says this, irrespective of boundary distance, diagram 40, provisions for external surfaces of walls in ADB, restricts the combustibility of external walls of high buildings where the top floor is at least 18 metres above ground level and those of the assembly and recreation purpose group to reduce the danger from fire spread up the external face of the building. Now, you'll note the word combustibility there. Mm -hmm. Do you consider that paragraph to be an accurate statement? Um... Well, my interpretation of this has always been, as I think we spoke about on Thursday, in the sense that combustibility is something that's binary. So a material and whatever is either non-combustible, or if it isn't non-combustible, it is combustible. Mm. Yes, uh, uh, indeed. So, um, so you hadn't finished though, had you? Well... Or had you? Yes, yes. You had, sorry. Yes, sorry. Uh, in, indeed, and... So what do you make of the phrase, diagram 40, restricts the combustibility of external walls of high buildings? Um, I guess, well, my, my interpretation of that is that it is referring to the different classifications that relate to predominantly BS 476 Part 7 and the surface spread of flame test. Obviously, Class O includes the um, fire propagation test as well. Um, but there is a hierarchy associated with um, flame spread um, ranging from the class 3 up to the class O being the best performing within that context. How does diagram 40 of approved document B, at least at 2000 in that edition, restrict the combustibility of the external surfaces of walls. Yeah, I mean, perhaps, I mean, I, I wouldn't necessarily um, describe it in that way now, um, in the sense that it is, um, but what it is trying to do is to say that, you know, the closer you are to the boundary, et cetera, then you have to have a better classification in terms of the surface spread of flame. So it's, it's, a, it's a graduation in terms of, you know, the performance, but accepting that all of the, the materials that are class O and above, or worse, are in effect combustible. Can I, I'm sorry to interrupt you so early, Mr. Millett, but can I just ask you this? Is there some confusion in, in, at this point and maybe in some other documents between the combustibility of, as it's put here, external walls mm -hmm. and combustibility of the external surfaces of the walls? Um, do you mean in terms of the entire wall makeup? Well, that's the point, because... As I understand class naught, it is actually a, a measure of the combustibility of the surface, mm -hmm. not necessarily of what's under the surface. Yes, although, of course, if you've got a, a product that has got a, a surface coating on it or whatever, then the performance of that surface is dependent upon what is behind it as well. Exactly, but what's, what's written here is that the diagram restricts the combustibility of external walls as if that 
relates to the whole of the substance of the external walls, whereas okay, class f uh, naught only speaks to the surface, doesn't it? And that's a confusion which, if it exists, as it seems to me at the moment it does, mm. is potentially rather dangerous. Yes, and I suppose that part of the issue that you're referring to there in this context would be the definition of external wall, which a lot could be solved by you know, a proper definition of external wall and what, what that actually means, if it means the, the whole wall makeup or yes. you know, just the um, external so, element um, of it. If we go back to my mm. <laughs> where I started, I mean, would, would you accept that there is a degree of confusion here between the surface and the substance? Um, well, that certainly seems to be the way that it has been interpreted. I mean, I think, um, yes, yes. Right. Thank you very much. Yes, I'm sorry, Mr. Mm. And, and in addition to the, 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 the answers to the questions that the chairman has just asked you, there's another confusion, isn't there, I would suggest, which is that, in fact, diagram 40 doesn't address combustibility in its sense defined in ADB at all, does it? Um, well, I say I go back to what I said before in, in, in it being a binary um, definition in that something is either non-combustible or, or it isn't. Mm. And if it's not non-combustible, it's combustible. Yes. And, you know, the... the you would not typically carry out a BS 476 part 6 and 7 test on something that you knew to be non-combustible. And in you, fact, you this statement... wouldn't do that. I'm sorry. Yes, sorry. No, I'm sorry, I thought you'd finished your... No, that's your fine, sorry. This statement is... I would, is it right that looking at it now, this statement is actually fundamentally erroneous for two separate reasons? For, first, because diagram 40 doesn't restrict combustibility strictly so called, and secondly, because it purports to restrict the combustibility, or the report says that it restricts the combustibility of the entire external wall, whereas in fact diagram 40 only relates to the surface. Well, that depends, as I said, as we've just said, on the definition of external wall, and my reading of this um, is that insofar as it is restricting and giving a graduation in terms of performance in relation to the surface spread of flame, then um, it is in some way contributing to restricting the combustibility. It is saying that you must use you know, better performing products the closer you are to the boundary. Mr. Millet, I'm sorry to interrupt you yet again, but yes. I understand that in some cases, there's a transcript problem. Can I ask, first of all, is your transcript working? My transcript is working, although I've seen the note right. on the subject, but yes, um, it is. I'm going to ask counsel who are here for the BRE whether their transcript is working. It's just come back. It's just come back? All right. Should we press on? And I Public will... transcript is running as well. Good. Sounds to me as though we may be back out of trouble, too. So. Very carry good. On. Let's continue. Um, Dr. Smith, you'll recall, and maybe you won't, but I'll give it to I'll give you the reference anyway, that um, you signed this report off, uh, uh, and it's page four. Mm -hmm. It's your signature bearing the date of the 30th of March 2000. Um, can we assume that you read this report carefully before you signed it off? Yes, I would have done. So can you explain, going back to page 14, how the... Um, the error or the confusion crept in? Why did you not correct it at the time to make it clear? Um, in terms of the way that we were interpreting that at the time and the fact that diagram 40 is headed, provisions of external surfaces of walls, um, our interpretation, well, we, we weren't aware that there was particular confusion around this point. But just as a matter of the way this is set out on the page, it isn't right that diagram 40 restricts the combustibility of external walls of high buildings. It, it's, it's much more refined than that, isn't it? Um, I don't entirely agree because of the reasons that I've just explained. Now, Sarah Colwell told us in her evidence that this wording would have been written by Brian Martin 
as she put it, the expert on that area. Does that accord with your recollection in, in relation to the division of work between you in production of this document? Um, that would be my expectation right. today, yes. I'm going to read into the record the reference. It's day 232 at page 36, line 17. That's just for our purposes for later. When you signed this off, was there some misunderstanding in your own mind at the time between class naught and combustibility? Uh, no. Did you ever detect that there was confusion in Mr. Martin's mind or, Ms. or Dr. Colwell's mind about, uh, about the differences between uh, what Diagram 40 did and the concept of combustibility as defined? Not that I was aware of, no. And yet, in answers to the chairman this morning and to me, uh, I think you accept uh, that diagram, the, the phrase Diagram 40 restricts the combustibility of external walls of high buildings is not accurate. Um, not entirely, no. No. I don't, but I well, don't entirely accept that it, it doesn't reflect um, the fact that, you know, uh, the, the combustibility issue, which I say we've, we've just discussed. Right. But t just tell me then, I, but maybe I've misunderstood your evidence. What is it in Diagram 40 that restricts the combustibility of external walls? So, basically, my understanding has always been that you would not be carrying out BS 476 Part 6 and or 7 tests on any product or material that is non-combustible. Therefore, clearly they are combustible. And then you have a ranking system in terms of their reaction to fire characteristics, which is built into Diagram 40. You'll see, you know, in diagram 40, you've got different classes depending upon the location on the building or where the building is actually located yeah. in proximity to adjacent buildings. But those classes are not combustibility tests, are they? Um, yes, to some degree. I think they are. You think they are? Well, 476 part 6. The more combustible, sorry, the more combustible a material is or product is, um, you know, the, the, the worse the spread of flame characteristics will be. 476 part 6, is that a combustibility test? 476 part, part 6. six. Um, insofar as it is measuring the amount of heat that's produced on exposure to an external radiant panel um, within the box, then it is measuring the amount of energy that's being released from the surface, hmm. but it's not a exposed. it's not a test, is it, for combustibility as opposed to non-combustibility, let alone a test for limited combustibility, is it? It's a test for propagation of fire. But there are very that there are a number of characteristics that you need to understand when you start talking about combustibility, and really what you're looking at is the contribution that a material or product can make to the fire growth behaviour. Similarly, part seven isn't a combustibility test, is it? It's a surface spread of flame test. But then the amount of energy that a product or material will contribute to a fire over a period of time is dependent upon the rate at which the fire can spread over the surface. So if, you can, if it spreads very, very quickly, then the energy that's contained within that product or material will be produced and, and released much more quickly. Clearly, if a product doesn't spread flame or you know, just sits there in, in the exposed zone, then the amount of energy and so on that's released will be much, much slower. So the, these things are, are all interdependent and are, um, you know, key factors in assessing the overall combustibility of a product or material. Mr Chairman, I'm getting a note again from those behind me that the transcript issue is, yes. is continuing. I don't <coughs> you, know whether it is. I think you and I can probably see the same note, yes. which suggests that the problem may be limited to the display screens in this room, um, which are not working at the moment. But those who are logged on to Opus, I think, are getting the fees. I hope that's right. Um, I'm just going to 
check with council who are sitting over there. Can I ask, are you, are you getting the transcript feed? Sir, I'm not logged into Overs at the moment. I'm using the transcript uh, on the screen. Oh, right. Well, I think all we can do, actually, is to mention it to those who are <coughs> in control of the technology and ask that they should try and restore the transcript to uh, the hearing room. But I think those who are using a transcript um, through Opus are probably still all right, and I think we ought to carry on. Right. You're happy to do that? Yeah. All right? Very well, Mr Chairman, yes. I'm sorry about that, <coughs> Dr Smith. It's a technical problem. Um, but j j I think I've understood your evidence on the word combustibility. Did you understand it in this report when you signed it off? As, as combustibility in, as it were, the loose sense, in other words, capability of burning, as opposed to the te any technical sense um, defined or indicated in approved document B. Correct, yes. Right, I see. Now, can we go back to page 12 then, please, in the literature review? There's a heading, facade costs, and there you'll see table one. Uh, in fact, there are three tables. Uh, uh, and what are described as types and costs of claddings, quoted in AJ, February 1998, for overcladding. Uh, and uh, if you um, go, please, down the, down the page, um, you'll see uh, that there's a table two, types and costs of curtain wall, and then over the page to page 13, and look at table three, you'll see the, the heading of that table, types and costs of infill panels, as quoted in AJ, February 1998 infill panel systems. And then the fourth entry down says co composite panel of 0.5 millimetres stove lacquered aluminium, 3 millimetres polyethylene core, 0.5 millimetres mill finish aluminium with insulation and vapour barrier bonded to rear face. And then there's a cost, 160 to 210. You see that? Yes. Now that's, that's <coughs> ACM with a polyethylene core, isn't it? Um, as we know it now, yes. It, did you not know it then? No. Uh, why is that? Um, I was not aware of that description of those particular products. I mean, it, this was the actual description that we had in relation to those products. We didn't know them as um, ACMs. Right. Uh, you could see, you could see, nonetheless, they, that it had three millimeters of polyethylene as the core. Yes, correct, from, yeah, the discussion, that's from the description here, yeah. No, and um, can I ask you, I mean, what assumptions did you make about its mineral content? Um, what, in, in... In the core? But what, in relation to Table 3 at the time? Yeah, what uh, assumptions what, did you make? I would not have made any assumptions. In relation to the mineral core content of the 3 millimetres polyethylene? Yeah, no, I would not have made any assumptions about right. it. So can we proceed on the, the, the basis that you... Um, might have known that it was 100% polyethylene. I would have based any thoughts around the description as provided. Right. Were you aware before you approved this report that ACM panels with a fully polyethylene core were used in the external wall arrangements of UK buildings? No. You weren't aware? No. Did you become aware when you read this table? Um... Th this would have been the only information that I had. Yes. Yeah. It, it may be, but on the basis that that was the only information you had, did you become aware that this product, as described here, was in use in the UK built environment? In the same way that all of the other products are listed, that, that would have been my only source of reference, yes. what, what was written here. So is that a yes, then, to the question? Um, well, yes, yes. If, if these products are the ones that mm. were in use. D did you ask yourself at the time why it was uh, that composite panels with a three millimeter, let it be assumed, 100% polyethylene core were in use on the external walls of buildings? Um, no, I wouldn't have done at that point. Why is that? Um, in some ways, you know, a, a lot of these products that are listed here would be potentially products that um, you might you might want to further investigate in terms of their fire performance. I mean, I would not personally have had any knowledge about how, how any of these products would have 
performed in a fire situation. No, um, but looking at the box and the title in this report, did you not? Did you not ask yourself? Did you not wonder? I wonder why uh, these panels, uh, as quoted in the Architects' Journal at that time, uh, are in use, perhaps even common use, uh, uh, on tall buildings in the UK built environment. I don't recall. I don't recall that at all. No. Right. So, therefore, it wasn't a surprise to you, is that right, to discover that such panels were in use? Um, well, as I say, I wouldn't have had any knowledge about what was in use at all until I, had, in, until I saw this report. I, I had no preconceived notion. I, I was not, you know, out there in, in the real world looking and surveying buildings, so I had no, no knowledge as to what, what was in use. No, that doesn't... I'm afraid it doesn't quite answer my question. My question was really, when you saw this for the first time, mm. did you not react by thinking or asking yourself, I wonder why it is that there are out there these composite panels with three millimetres of polyethylene? I don't recall that specifically in relation to this. No. Right. So you weren't concerned to discover it for the first time? Um, I don't recall. I, I don't know. What did you know at the time about the properties, the fire reaction properties of polyethylene? Um, that it's basically a, a thermoplastic. Um, and, I mean, one of the performances um, of thermoplastics is they have a tendency to, to melt um, on exposure to heat. And in some, some cases, that actually um, means that the, 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 the thermoplastic itself... Um, runs away from from the fire, um, but apart from that, you know, we wouldn't have known. I wouldn't have known how this product, as it was constituted there, would perform in a in a fire scenario. You say it has a tendency to melt and run away from the fire. Yes. D did you not also know that it would burn as it dripped and ran? It, yes. Yes. I mean, flames. it will it will burn. It's the extent to which it. Um, and, and where it accumulates, in effect, yes. when, when it's melting and, and dripping. Yes. C can we agree this much, at least, that you knew at the time, whatever else you might not have known about polyethylene's reaction to fire characteristics, mm -hmm. that it was combustible in all senses? Yes. 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 In, in relation to compliance with the guidance as it then stood in approved document B, w would there have been any particular reason for concern in discovering that ACM panels were being used to clad high-rise buildings where they had a polyethylene core? That did not... I, I don't recall what the discussion would have been around that. I say it wasn't specific <coughs> to, um, to that particular product at that time. It was taken in the context of all of the other tables that are presented here as well and the other products which equally you could look at and, and see from a fire situation you might want to investigate further. Hmm. Because in principle, you know, they, you, uh, there were some, some others as well that, that you, you might look at and think, well, I'm not sure quite how that might perform in a fire either. No. D d did you have any thoughts <clears throat> along the lines of how it would be that such panels could comply with the then standing approved document B? I don't recall having had that consideration or discussion. I mean, right. Brian Martin would have led on, on that sort of area of, um, of discussion. Right. You say he would have led on it. Does that mean that you were, in some senses, reliant on his expertise? Um, yes. Right. Yes. Was, was he more of an expert in the field of fire science than you, would you say? No. So why were you... No, Brian's area of expertise, um, I think as we, we spoke about before, it was on the approved document and the interpretation and so on of the approved documents. Right. Do you know, <clears throat> from your own knowledge at the time, whether Brian Martin had any concerns of his own about how it could be that the panels identified in this table with a three millimetre polyethylene cork were compliant with approved document B as it then stood? I don't know. Did it occur to you at the time, before any experimental testing took place, as we know it did, not long after this, 
that the use of polyethylene in the external wall at height might present a serious danger in the event of fire? I don't recall that one being considered um, as, a, as a special case. Right. So can we take it that you don't recall any discussion either within the BRE or with the department about this issue at the time? Not at that time. Not no. at that time. Did you consider looking at this, doc this document uh, and this product in the table at this time, how it could be that the use of polyethylene in the external wall of a high-rise building could comply with the functional requirement in B4 of the building regulations? Uh, not at that time, no. Did you consider at the time whether ACMP panels could achieve class naught, whether or not it was an appropriate classification? Um. I don't recall whether right. we would have had that discussion or not. Just trying that slightly differently. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and of, on the assumption that these panels would be said to have met class naught, did, did you simply assume that a class naught material or product would always meet the functional requirement, or did you think that some class products or materials might not? Um, I don't recall at that particular time. Right. I think, you know, that we, we were on a, the whole point of the research project was to investigate these things. And this obviously was the first step in the research project. And that was to be followed by the experimental program. Did you consider at this time, or did you come to consider whether given the functional requirement in B4, class naught was an appropriate classification for a composite product at all? Um, I don't recall at the time. At the time. No. Did you ever later come to consider that question? Um, I can't remember whether right. we've had that discussion or not. And therefore it would follow that, particularly with a combustible core, a panel with a combustible core, was something you never asked yourself about or never asked the question, how is class naught appropriate? Um, probably not within that context. I mean, the, the context for this, um, for me, was always around this research project, what it was seeking to achieve, and then beyond that, obviously later on, the adoption of BS 8414 and the, and the criteria, and the introduction of that into the approved document. Yes. Um, and then, you know, the, so from the outcomes of this research project and the classification criteria that were then derived in BR 135, it was my um, sort of absolute understanding from there on in that the door was closed in the use of these types of products and materials in the future. Um, well, that would be so, I think. Is this right? If BS 8414 and the BR 135 criteria were adopted as the sole route to compliance, but not if you left class naught in ADB? Well, I mean, our understanding and interpretation was, and, and this is where the confusion around the term filler, which is now apparent but wasn't apparent to us at the time, um, obviously had, a, had an impact. Right. But p picking up on your... Um, your point about the revisions. Can we go to par page 27 of this document <coughs> and find the conclusions of the literature review there? And you'll see, Dr. Smith, at the top of your screen, the word conclusions. The main findings from this review have been, and then there are some numbers. Mm -hmm. And if you look at number two, it says this. The 2000 revision of ADB goes some way to addressing the issues of fire performance of external cladding systems the review of BR135 will help to clarify any remaining issues as identified. Now, is that a reference, I'm just bearing in mind the date of this, which is March 2000, is that a reference to the version of the approved document which came into force in the July of that year, July 2000? I would imagine so, yes. Yes. I mean, we, it, the, the previous version was the 1992 second edition, which ran from June, June 92 to July 2000, so that, that's, that must be right. 
Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, Had the BRE played any role in drafting or advising on or assisting with the 2000 amendments to the approved document? Um, I don't know. You don't know? No. Can we take it that you were familiar at the time with the provisions of the guidance in approved document B? Um, to some extent, not entirely. I mean, that wasn't the area that I was working in until really this, this project. But as a result of working on this project, did you come then to be fully familiar with at least the 2000 version, if not its predecessor? In part, yes. I mean, I wouldn't have an extensive um, oversight of every element of the approved document. I mean, it wasn't my job and role to be interpreting that on a daily basis. So it would only be on the, you know, on, on a need to know basis. You say in part. Did, yes. did one of those parts include section 12? What, what became section 12 later, um, I think section 13 in the 2000 version, um, namely external wall. Yes, I would have, um, I would have familiarised myself yeah. with it, but I would not be asked to interpret it in the real world, if you, if you, if you get my meaning, it's, it's slightly different. I would not be applying that to any projects or whatever in the external world. Yeah. Now, looking at the text of paragraph two under the conclusions here, <coughs> um, where it says that the revision goes some way to addressing the issues of fire performance of external claddings, mm -hmm. uh, cl cladding systems, the review of BR135 will help to clarify any remaining issues as identified. Um, what specifically were the issues in relation to the fire performance of external cladding systems had the 2000 revision of approved document be, as it says here, gone some way to addressing? Yeah, I mean, I can't be definitive on that. Um, I wasn't involved in the revisions and so on, but um, my guess is that this was all related to the um, parliamentary um, select committee and um, the work that they had undertaken, and that's really what then led to the need to um, embody the classification criteria into um, BR135. But in order to sort of validate that, um, this research project was commissioned by the department to, to enable that data and information to be collected. Right. Let, let's, um, let's look at the revision. Um, can you remember, though, before we do, how it was that the 2000 revision of approved document B had addressed these issues or gone some way? to doing so? Um, I can't remember, no. no. Let's look at it then to help you. Um, can we put up uh, approved document B2000 uh, against the original? Um, it, I'd like to have both up on the screen. CLG 150, sorry, 140 12. Sorry, 150 is 12, page 89. Um, the documents provider has done an excellent job in getting there before me. Now, um, what we have uh, on uh, the left-hand side uh, is the previous edition, which is the 1992 uh, approved document B. And on the right-hand side, what has become section 12 in the 2000 edition, and you can see there that the requirements for external surfaces in both versions are that the external walls of a building over a certain height should meet the provisions of diagram 40. You see that? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, there's 12.5 in the 1990, uh, um, 12 in the 1992 edition on the right-hand side. Uh, and uh, 13.5 in the 2000 edition. Mm -hmm. Uh, now, um, both diagrams stipulate class naught, don't they? Let me show you that. Um, at page 75 and page 90. So right-hand side, if we go forward a page, and left-hand side, if we go forward a page. Both versions there. Um, we need to go, that's it, thank you. Di it's diagram 36 and diagram 40. Both versions there stipulate di uh, class naught, don't they? Yes. And the only difference... Uh, was um, was the height. On the right-hand side, which is the 1992 version, it was 20 metres, mm -hmm. and on the left-hand side, 2000 Amendment, 18 metres, yes? Yes. Both say class naught, yes? Yes. Yes. 
Uh, and in addition, I think it's right that the 2000 edition of the approved document added, um, if we go back to it, at 13.5, if we go back on the uh, left-hand side two pages, to uh, paragraph 13.5, as you'll see, uh, no, sorry, page 89, we, know, we want there, 13.5, there, there we are. Um, Uh, under the note, one alternative to meeting the provisions in Diagram Court 40 could be BRE Fire Note 9. Yes? Correct, yes. Uh, now, that, that's, that was new, wasn't it? Um, yes, I believe so. Uh, and was that one of the amendments that would go some way to addressing the issues that was referred to in the conclusions to the literature review? I would assume so, yes. Right. Now, it's right to think, isn't it, that Fire Note 9 was not conceived with the spread of fire over the, over the external surface of the walls in mind, was it? Um, well, clearly, that's one of the things that it's measuring. Well, let me try it differently. External surface fire spread a cladding system on fire, is another way of putting it, was not the problem which Fire Note 9 was seeking to solve, was it? My understanding was that, yes, it was looking at the fire performance of external cladding systems in the, in, in the, in the round, and therefore that is one of the aspects that it would be looking at. There's not very much in BR135, as it then turned into in 2003, about external fire spread, is there? In BR135? Yes, as it turned into. We, I, I'm not following you, sorry. Well, we'll Which come to version? It. Yes. We'll come to it. But um, in, in fact, Fire Note 9 was a, a, a full system test, wasn't it? Correct. It wasn't measuring or quantifying the external spread of flame. Not in isolation? No. Um, and, in fact, on this and later amend, uh, amendments to approve document B, an external wall product like a panel did not have to uh, meet the requirements of BR135 through a BS8414 test. It simply needed to satisfy class naught. Um, well, that's, that was not my interpretation of what was in there, but I guess we'll come to that later. I see. Yeah. Well, then, if that wasn't, could you just explain 13.5 to us? 13.5, which is the amendment made in 2000, says the external surfaces of walls should meet the provisions in diagram 40. Note, one alternative to meeting the provisions in diagram 40, 40 could be BRE Fire Note 9. So you didn't have to satisfy... No, I, no, I accept that in this context. Yeah. Yes, yes. And they were always alternatives, weren't they? That never changed, not until 2018. Um, the 2006 version also has some text in there about the performance of the insulation. Yes, well, we're not talking about and insulation, though, are we? We're talking about the external surfaces of walls, which is what Diagram yes, 40 is about. But it also, I mean, this is where the um, paragraph in the 2006 version also refers to filler material. And, you know, that. Mm. so within that context, yeah. it's not as simple as what's written here in the 2000 version. Uh, that may be so. It may have become complicated, and we'll come to that in due course. Dr. Smith, forgive me for taking a long historical run-up to this, but, yes. but at this point in time, it's right to think that, you, and that, that the, the partial cure to the issues that industry was seeing and which your literature review was addressing mm -hmm. was met by the introduction of BRE, what became BRE 135, but Fire Note 9, as an alternative to meeting Diagram 40. Correct. Yes. Now, turning to insulation, if we look, uh, please, at the right-hand side and go back a page, 
to page 74, which is the 1992 version of approved document B. That required insulation in the external wall construction, uh, as you can see in 12.5, um, sorry, 12.7, external wall construction. You see, mm -hmm. it says in the second sentence there, Oh, the second paragraph. In a building with a story at more than 20 metres above ground level, insulation material used in the external wall construction should be of limited combustibility, see Appendix A. And then you have the exception for masonry cavity wall constructions. You see that? Yes. Now, now if you look uh, to page 90 on the left-hand side, in the 2000 version of the approved document B, if you look at what, is, what became 13.7, uh, I'm sorry, we have to get back a page, page 89. Page 89, yes, that's it. External wall construction, 13.7. You can see that the second paragraph's been amended, and it now says, and you can compare the two, in a building with a story 18 metres or more above ground level, insulation material used in ventilated cavities in the external wall construction should be of limited combustibility. Can you explain the rationale for the introduction of the words in ventilated cavities? No, I can't. It, it, it's a narrowing, isn't it, of the circumstances in which the guidance asked for insulation to be of limited combustibility? It certainly appears so, yes. Do you, you don't know why that was? No, I don't. Did you ever notice it at the time? Um, no, I don't believe I did. Do you know, you didn't notice it at the time, so that would tell us that there was no discussion within the BRE, to your knowledge, of that narrowing? Well, not that I was involved in. No. I mean, Can you tell uh, us from your own knowledge who, how, who suggested it or how it came about? No, I wouldn't know that. Right. But, I mean, the people that were working in that area, it was, as, as we spoke about on Friday, would, uh, Thursday, sorry, would have right. been um, Tony Morris and potentially um, a colleague of his, Richard Reed, who were involved mm. in, who was involved in, in this area. Right. And what about <clears throat> Brian Martin, who I think you told us? Was um, yeah, I, I can't remember when Brian joined, so I don't know how much involvement he would have had in the 2000 version of the approved document. But um, I, I mean, he will be able to right. answer those questions. I'm right. sure. W can you recall when you became aware for the first time that the 2000 version had amended and narrowed? the uh, restriction in relation to insulation material in the external wall construction? No, I don't remember. Right. Now, the let's look at the functional requirement. Um, can we please uh, have up on the screen a page 72 of the document on the right? And page seven and page eighty six <coughs> of the document on the left. Now, um, the the one on the left is a little bit fuzzy because of the co the copying, but we'll mm. do our best with it. I hope you can see it. Yes. On the right, which is the nineteen ninety two version of the functional requirement, it says. The external walls of the building, this is B41, the external walls of the building shall resist the spread of fire over the walls and from one building to another, having regard to the height, use and build, position of the building. And then in 2000, that's amended, as you can see, to the words, the external walls of the building shall adequately resist the spread of fire over the walls, etc. So you can see that the word adequately has now been inserted into the functional requirement in 2000. Yes. Yes? So we've moved from resisting external fire spread altogether to resisting it adequately. Yes? Yes. Do you have any recollection yourself of th that amendment? No. Do you have any recollection of any discussion about the reasons for that amendment? Not that I was involved in at all, no. Do you know anything about the background to that amendment? No. When did you first l learn, if you ever did, of that amendment? Um, yeah, I'm not sure I learned of it being a difference. Um, obviously, the 2000 version would have been the, the 
the first version that I would have looked at in the context of this particular project. So, yes, I don't know why that was put in there or where it came from. No, you, but you don't remember when you discovered that the word adequately had been inserted into the 2000 edition? No. Was this not something that you were looking at as part of your literature review and the amendments leading up to the um, July 2000 amendments? Well, obviously, I wasn't involved in the detailed work um, on the literature review. I was the um, approver of the mm. report. Um, so unless it was brought to my attention at that point, I, I wouldn't necessarily have been aware of it. Did anybody give you a briefing before you signed off as the approver of the conclusions, which include conclusion two, mm -hmm of the proposed amendments to approve document B? In terms of what, what time frame, what do you mean the proposed amendments? Well, um, you signed off, let's take it in stages, you signed off as approved the literature review with its conclusions on the 30th of March 2000. Yes. Before you did that, did anybody give you a briefing on the proposed amendments um, of approved document B, or indeed the the functional requirement? Not that I can recall. Right. So when you signed it off, what was the state of your knowledge about what those proposed amendments were? Um, I don't recall. I mean, I would have signed the report off based upon the content of the report as provided to me, so the text that would have been, you know, included within the report. But if you didn't know what the proposed amendments were, how could you sign off a report that said that they went some way to satisfying the issues? Well, in the content of the report, it, it explains what... Um, well, if it doesn't explain that, then somebody <coughs> would obviously have told me, must have told me what um, right. that they were going to refer to Fire Note 9, I guess. Anything else? But I don't recall first-hand... I'm just trying to um, unpick the context and, and roll, roll my mind back, but it's, right. it's, it's a long time ago. Right. Now, um, I don't want to ask you about the meaning of words in a statutory piece of guidance, but did there come a time when you had your own understanding about what the word adequately connoted? Um, no, it was always a point that was a point of debate amongst the industry as well, you know, as to who, who defines what, what is adequate. Now, you say it was always a point of debate. When did that debate begin? Um, well, I became aware of it probably um, in the 2000s at some point. Right. In so you know, attending conferences and seminars and so on, and just picking up those sorts of discussions that would have generally happened. So there did come a point then that you learnt about the insertion of the word adequately into the functional requirement? Well, I'm not sure it would have been in the context of this has just suddenly appeared. It would have been within the context of this exists, who defines what is adequate. And, and, and in the early, you say in the 2000s at some point, the debate began about what the word adequately meant. What was the answer? Well, sorry, let me start again. Did the BRE itself ever give an answer or suggest an answer to that question, to your knowledge? Not to my knowledge, no. That would not have been, my view is, that would not have been our role to have done so. That is a matter for, because it, it exists in the statutory requirements, it would be a matter for government to define what is adequate and what is suitable. Um, Do you recall an occasion in which government, on which government was ever asked that question? I don't personally. You don't personally? I'm, I'm not aware of when, right. you know, if industry asked for clarification around what adequate meant. I'm, I, I don't know. Did it ever occur to you as the points person at the BRE to ask government, Anthony Bird or Brian Martin perhaps, about why it was that the word adequate was inserted and what was meant, so that you could tell your clients? Again, I mean, if anybody had asked us to define adequate, then we would have referred them to the department 
for that discussion, we would not provide that advice and we would not um, you know, discuss that particularly with our clients. It, because it's right, there, there's the, clearly the, different ways to, de hmm. to um, define and, and to demonstrate adequacy. Yeah. I mean, certainly it's a point that um, the department were very well aware of because, you know, they sat in some of the workshops and conferences and so on and, and would have heard the same, hmm. the same questions. So, I mean, but only they can answer to if they were ever asked and then how they responded to that. So can we just understand, that despite the debate, as you say, which started sometime in the 2000s, the BRE, to your knowledge, never took that up with government and said, look, you need to clarify this because there's a debate. We would have raised it with them and said, you know, there's an issue around adequacy. Oh, you did? And, and, and they were fully aware of that anyway because, right. you know, they sat in some of the same discussions that, that I was personally sat in or yeah. other people from BRE were sat in. OK, let's just break that down. So you recall sitting in discussions, do you, with people from government and discussing the meaning of, or the intended meaning of the word adequately? Well, not, not necessarily discussing the meaning of it, but where the issues around, well, what does adequate mean? Yes, well, that's... that's yes, but, but not necessarily providing an answer to the question. And what did government say during those discussions? I don't recall. I mean, you, you'd need to... I suspect that people wouldn't have given an answer there and then, they would have to take that back and it would have to be an agreed response to something like that. It's not something that one individual would be able to sit there and um, define. No, I'm not asking really about whether somebody could define it. I'm just, I'm just really getting your recollection of the discussions. Who said what and when about the word adequately? Yeah, no, I can't give you chapter and verse in, in that respect. Can you give us the gist? Well, I think it's, it's as I've already described. I mean, people would say, well, who, what does adequate mean within this context and who, who defines it? But you're talking to government. Who was it you were discussing it with? I would have um, discussed it with Anthony Bird. Yeah. Anybody else? And potentially Brian Martin. Right. And do you remember what they said about the word adequately? Um, I mean, they, they will need to answer to that themselves. I mean, my, my view is, and my recollection is, that initially, anyway, they, they, their view was, well, yes, it's a little bit vague, isn't it? Right. It's not definitive. No. But then there's a lot of, you know, other um, regulation that, I guess you could argue not necessarily in the fire context as well, that it's similar. It's a little bit vague. Were you not interested to know why a, a word which introduced vagueness into an otherwise absolute provision had been inserted? Um, I mean, it really wasn't for, for me to question what the government had decided to do in terms of their own legal framework. I wonder about that. Let me try it differently. Can you help with this? When BRE second edition, 2003, was in production, say between the date of the literature review and sometime in 2003, and therefore, after the word adequately had been inserted into the functional requirement, to your knowledge, Dr. Smith, did anybody at the BRE ever consider whether BR135, meeting the criteria in BR135, would satisfy the word adequately, so that you knew that if you'd passed BR135, the performance of your uh, external wall would be adequate for the purposes of the functional requirement? My understanding is that that would have been discussed and it would have 
the fact that it was um, accepted and the research as it was carried out was all presented, that that then was accepted as a demonstration of adequacy. But if nobody, well, if, if adequately was vague, how did they know, how did anybody know, how did the BRE know that the outputs from a BS8414 test meeting BR135 criteria would satisfy? Um, well, in terms of the support for the, um, the outputs from the project mm. and also the... Um, the, the, the commitment from the Parliamentary Select Committee to acceptance that the, what was then, I think, Fire Note 9, was suitable and needed to be adopted within the guidance. But if there were no criteria, objective criteria, by which to measure the word adequacy, how did you know whether the outputs from a BS8414 test meeting, BR135, would satisfy uh, the word adequate? Well, I think it was implicit in the fact that the standard and the um, document BR135 were accepted. Let's go back to the third conclusion, then, of the literature review. Page 27. Uh, that's BRE, one, BRE 401353, <coughs> page 27. Conclusion 3. The work to date suggests that a large scale test method is necessary to assess the performance of the complete system. Now, th now, that was not a new discovery, was it, as at spring 2000? Um, no. No. And it, I think you agree with me. It had been noted in Fire Note 3 and Fire Note 9. Correct. Yes. Had you or Sarah Colwell or Brian Martin, for that matter, previously considered that small-scale testing of individual components of a cladding system to the BS476 standards could, quotes, assess the performance of the complete system, unquote? Um, yes, I believe people had considered that. So probably Sarah had in her earlier involvement um, in the, um, was it Fire Notes? I uh, don't know if she was involved in Fire Note 3, but certainly Fire Note 9. Um, and yes, I discussed it, and I would have discussed it with Sarah at the time. And during the course of this project, was any consideration given, either within the BRE or in discussions with the department, to limiting all elements of the external wall construction, or at least all significant elements, of the external wall construction to materials or products of limited combustibility or non-combustible? Um, I don't know. You don't know one way or the other? No. Does that mean you can't remember? Or you, I you, don't know one way or the know. other. I don't know if any, any discussion took place between other people and the department around that particular right. issue. Other than your own knowledge of the 2000 amendments to approved document B, such as it was, which I think, except from me, did not implement the recommendation of the Select Committee to have BS8414 in place of Class 0, what was your own state of knowledge at the time of, of, of whether the Department would follow the Select Committee's recommendation that all external cladding systems should be required to be entirely non-combustible or tested to full scale? Um, I think in 2000, when this project was initiated, the view was that obviously a number of things needed to be put in place. Um, obviously, we didn't have BS8414 at that particular time. It was still Fire Note 9. So that then had to be developed and published and so on, and the classifications published. So it, it was almost like a, a journey in terms of the implementation of the recommendations from the Select Committee. Yes. And that, that was my expectation, that that was where this was all, yes. all, all heading. Did you ever have any discussions with Anthony Bird or anybody else from the department about... Uh, whether Class naught should be dropped? Um, well, not at that time, because there was nothing to replace it with. 
Well, you had the uh, uh, arriving Fire Note 9, which then became BS8414. Yes, but it hadn't arrived in 2000, so, you know, we were on that journey, if you like. So, right. yes. You say you were on a journey. Did you and Anthony Bird or anybody else in the department ever discuss at what point that journey would end and Class Nought would be dropped? Um, I mean, obviously, we understood, and BRE understood, that... The changes would be made at um, a revision point within the cycle for the approved document, um, and that because that's typically how it how it works. Um, so once the British standards were were ready and published and so on, then at the, at the relevant point in the cycle, those would then be adopted, and that was the expectation at that time. I see. And when was the next um, revolution of the cycle? Um, well, we understood, obviously, that emerged to, to, to be 2006. Right. I think it was like a five- or six-year right. revision cycle, typically, um, around, around that time. And what was it about Fire Note 9 that meant that it couldn't be adopted straight away as the full-scale test in place of Class North? I... I think it was mainly the fact that in the approved document it predominantly refers to either national or European or international standards and clearly Fire Note 9 was none of those. It was, if you like, a, a BRE in-house standard so it was felt that it then needed to go through the standards making process and be opened up to full discussion and consultation with the industry and all the stakeholders at large to um, improve the, um, the, the the standard in in the way that you would expect for a British standard there's a you know a different um, a different process is, is is gone through was it your expectation that class naught would be dropped then come the next iteration of approved document B um, I don't recall exactly what the expectation would have been around that, because this was all um, also complicated by the introduction of the um, European test standards as well during yes. this period. Yes, which came in in a 2002 amendment. Uh, yes, I believe so. Yes. Um, Mr Chairman, I'm going to turn to a new topic, uh, <coughs> a slight, well, vaguely new topic, uh, but I won't finish it before the break, but I do think I should make a start on it. Oh, do, yes. Yeah. Well, we started a little late, I'm afraid, so yes, well, that's perfectly right. Right, thank you. Um, now, can we then uh, look at BRE 30041836, please? This is a new, a new area of inquiry. It, it, it's, a, it, it's a continuing but semi-new area of inquiry. In that case, can I just raise a question which I don't think you answered already, and if you have, I apologise for asking it again. Um, <clears throat> it concerns how uh, Fire Note 3 and Fire Note 9 came into existence, the intention was, as I understand it, to um, produce a test which would demonstrate compliance with B4, functional requirement B4. Is that right? That's my understanding. Um, since functional requirement B4 either did, at one stage, not include the word adequately, so it just said uh, resist fire without providing any um, numbers, mm -hmm. Um, someone must have um, taken a view when formulating Fire Note 9, let's say, um, as to what uh, the criteria should be. Mm -hmm. Do you know how that was done and no, who did I, it? I'm afraid I don't. I mean, it would have been Tony Morris and his co-workers at the time because he was leading on, on all of that work. So it sounds, as far as you know, that we can assume that uh, those who were doing that work took a certain view of the, the extent to which fire resistance was required, whatever the wording at the time, mm -hmm. and built that in to Fire Note 9, which became BS8414. That would be my understanding, yes. All right. Yes, thank you very much. Okay. Hmm. Yes, thank you, Mr. Williams. Yes, thank you. Now, um, can we then turn to the document which I, I want to look <coughs> at, which is the bid document? Uh, if we just have a look at page one, just to refresh 
all of our memories about this document. This is the bid by BRE to undertake work for DETR under the framework agreements. Uh, and this was um, the title, Review of Fire Performance of External Cladding Systems and Revision of BRE Report BR135, which at that stage was a 1988 edition. Um, if we go to page three, you can see that on that page there was a proposal uh, that the BRE uh, should undertake a survey of current stock in relation to the cladding of high-rise buildings in the UK. And you'll see that under the specific objectives. Yes. First bullet point. Um, now, that was, a, that was accomplished by compiling a six-page questionnaire for completion by a selected number of relevant local authorities, wasn't it? Uh, I believe so. Yes. Let's, look, let's go to the questionnaire. That's a BRE 30041885, please. And it's entitled BRE Cladding Survey, and you can see that there are some numbers down the left-hand side, uh, ages of buildings. You see that? Yes. Did you approve that uh, survey? Um, I don't recall. In Possibly I did. Right. Um, it would also have had to have been approved by the department before it went out. Yes. Um, because they, they had to approve anything where you were surveyed, right. surveying industry. Now, we can scroll through it to see the nature of the questions. Uh, you've got the number of uh, units above 18 metres, the age group of the buildings, refurbishment, types of cladding. Uh, uh, and uh, if you um, turn the page to take page two, you can see rendered systems or rain screen systems. And then going down to page three, please, you can see infill or built-ups. And then you've got um, the kinds of fibre underneath par uh, paragraph eight insulation, mineral or polymeric, uh, and then if you go over the page of the polymerics under 8.2, you're asked whether they're EPS, PUR, PIR or phenolics, you see that? Yes. And if we go to page four lower down, uh, you can see the respondents are asked about fire stopping and whether they are aware of the use of cavity barriers, yes? Correct. Yes, and at page five at question 11, you can see it says... Have you had any incidents involving fire spread due to external cladding systems? Any details would be appreciated. Yes? Yes. Um, now, for that, I think it's right that the BRE then created an Excel spreadsheet to record the responses to this survey. Let's look at that. It's at BRE 301, sorry, 3041886. It's the next document on, actually, in the series. And that is an Excel spreadsheet. So we'll need the native version of that, please. Now, these take some time to pull up because of the nature of the document. Okay. So just bear with us, Dr. Smith, please. It's BRE 30041886. Yes, here it comes. Um, right, thank you. Now that is um, the Excel spreadsheet. If we can go to the first tab, Introduction, which I think we're on, you can see um, that it records just over halfway down the text inside the box, which starts to date. Uh, you've got 45 surveys that have been distributed, 17 responses have been received, and of those, Three were nil returns, one is still trying to provide the data, and 13 full returns were provided. Mm -hmm. Do you know why only 45 questionnaires were sent out? No, I don't. You don't know who took that decision? No. Do you know who chose the list of recipients? Um, it, typically, in these sorts of um, instances, it would be discussed between our project team, our project manager, and the department. I see. Were you party to those discussions? Um, no, I wouldn't have been. Do you know on what basis these organisations were selected? No, I don't. Okay. Um, now, you can see um, that one of the organisations was W.S. Atkins. Uh, and um, if you go, please, to 
BRE 3041886 to the sheet entitled Survey Responses, uh, you can see uh, if you go to column C, W.S. Atkins, and they are um, type 1, and type 1, take it from me, as a specifier. Do you know what kind of organisation W.S. Atkins was? Um, in this context, so presumably then they were specifying what went on to buildings. If we go down then to row 54 in column C, we scroll down to 54, question 11, there's a yes, and there's a note that's added to the cell. If we could just open up the note. I think you may have to enable editing to do it. That's it. If we, okay, if we can open the cell, uh, we have some of the text, but not all of it, which I'll have to ask you to take from me. Mm -hmm. It says, BRE, spread of flames generally rapid due to loss of integrity of, and then the words that follow, take from me, are composite aluminium panels using combustible cores. Mm -hmm. Now, can you help us? Is, is that a note of what was recorded on W.S. Atkins's survey response, particularly to question 11? I don't know. I would assume probably yes, mm. but I, I, don't, I can't be definitive about that. Right. Did you, or to your knowledge, anybody else, either at the BRE or in government, uh, contact WS Atkin to find out what the composite aluminium panels using combustible cores were? I don't know. And were they ACM with a PE core or a sandwich panel or infill panel or the like? No, I, don't I don't know. know. No. Did you see this spreadsheet at the time? Um, I would have probably seen it um, as part of the uh, pack that comes to you for approval of, of the report. Did you open up the cell that I've just opened up? I with? don't recall. I don't recall. Do you recall any discussion at the time about WS's Atkins' discovery? Um, I don't recall that, um, but clearly, you know, the responses to the questionnaire, etc., were then used to help formulate the experimental programme. Right, yes, I see that. Um, was this spreadsheet sent to the department, or is it an internal, or did um, it remain an internal BRE document? I don't know. I would imagine it probably did get sent, but I, I don't know. Others, others would know that. Right. Let's look then at another document, BRE 3041887. Uh, now, this is the project report, dated 24th of July, 2000, it was issued to Anthony Bird outlining the results of the BRE's cladding survey and it provided various options for large scale experimental studies. And let's go to page two. You can see that the report was prepared by Sarah Colwell and approved by you, yes? Correct. And then at page six, if we go to that, you can see survey responses. And the report says there, um, underneath, 45 questionnaires were issued. Of these, 17 responses were received. Figure 1 summarises the categories and responses received. The number of responses received was less than expected. In fact, it's right, isn't it, that there were only 13 full responses? Um, based on what you showed earlier, that, yes. Yes. Do you know why the BRE didn't issue further surveys to other organisations when it became apparent that the response rate was so low? I don't. I mean, I'm... I'm pretty sure that this would have been discussed with the department at the time, and there would have been some follow-up to those where there had been no, no response received at all. With only about a third of the organisations actually responding to the BRE survey, do you know how the BRE uh, or government could gain a proper and comprehensive understanding of the current industry practice in relation to the overcladding of building stock in the United Kingdom? I'm sure this would have been discussed between the project team and the department at the time, mm. and then the decision would have been taken um, jointly. Jointly, right. So it was a joint decision, was it, to proceed without issuing further surveys to other organisations to get a better data um, set? Well, we would have sought the view of the department as to whether they felt that it, it was adequate or not. Did anybody from the department suggest to you that perhaps more data than 17 or even 13 responses was needed and more surveys should be set I, up? I don't know. 
If we look at page 10 of this document, and there's a, a, a heading, Summary and Options Report, Survey Conclusions. You see survey conclusions, it, it, it concludes as follows. First bullet point, based on this survey, it would appear that although the number of responses have been limited, they provide sufficient data to form a consistent view of the types of external cladding systems used in the public housing sector. On what basis was that conclusion reached? Do you know? Um, no. I mean, I would anticipate, reading this now, that it would have looked at the types of responses that we were getting back, and if there was a consistency in the responses that we had had, that would have been what would have... Um, you know, dictated that conclusion. Did you yourself have a view at the time about whether this was a, su a sufficient data set on which to form a, an opinion? I don't recall at the time. Um, I'm sure we would have had some, some discussion around that. Um, clearly, one of the things that, that would have been looked at as well would have been who, who, you know, which areas or which local authorities or so on would, would have responded. If we go to figure one on page seven, which is back three pages in the report, you can see there that, uh, and we need to expand the table, please, if we can do that. Figure one, questionnaires returned by respondent type. Uh, you can see there that it looks as though the number of surveys actually returned by local authorities in England was five, yes? Uh, it's the little purple or um, burgundy yes, coloured. That, that, yes, I see. Yeah. That. And three in Scotland, one of which was a nil return. Yes, I yeah, can and see. And one that. in Wales, yes? Yes. So a total of eight. Yes. Yeah. But I think it's also acknowledged if you look at the final paragraph on the same page, if you scroll down to that, please, that, and I quote under the heading specifiers and suppliers, the suppliers and specifiers identified a total of 193 units, but it has not been possible to quantify how many of these units are duplicates of those already provided by the local authorities. Now, just pausing on that sentence and taken together with the table, do you agree that this is really quite a long way from the comprehensive survey of the UK building stock that, would pro that was proposed in the bid for this contract? Um. Well, the results, I mean, the, the, the issue with a lot of these um, types of surveys is indeed in getting the responses back. I mean, it's very difficult to get busy people to, to respond and to see the need to respond. Um, and it also probably points to the fact that a lot of the local authorities didn't actually know the answer to a lot of the questions. Well, let's just see. If we, if we just go back, please, to BRE 3041836. We, we looked at this earlier, but I just want to revisit it in the light of the answer that you've just given us. Go to page five in that. This is BRE 3041836. And this is the bid document we saw. Uh, and the heading Programme of Work and Method Statement. And uh, under the uh, title or heading Preferred Approach at the start of the page, it says, the approach adopted in this proposal is to provide the department with information relevant to actual construction practice. This information will be derived from a comprehensive survey of the UK building stock, which will form the basis for DETR to specify generic external cladding systems for experimental investigation. So it's clear that you were bidding for a contract in which there would be a comprehensive survey of the UK building stock. Now, that's right, looking at the responses we've seen, that, that at, at that stage you hadn't done a comprehensive survey, had you? Um, well, as I said earlier, I mean, it would have been discussed at all stages with the department, um, with the fact that um, we were getting a lot of no responses, I guess, or nil returns. And um, the department, in discussion with us, would have decided right. if that was adequate or not. P presumably they did, did they? Well, yes. The fact that the project continued, that must have been the conclusion. 
Uh, Mr Chairman, I've got three questions left on this line before turning to a, a slightly different line of questions beyond the same yes. document. If you go, please, yeah. to page 10 of the, surve of the survey, that's back at BRE 3041887, on page 10 at the second bullet point, in the middle of your screen, it says, whilst no one clear system was identified, the majority of systems used by local authorities appears to be the render-based systems with rain screen systems representing around 12% of the market. Did you yourself genuinely consider that conclusions based on such a limited data set, 13 responses from local authorities and only 12% of the market um, for rain screen, some of which was duplicated, could truly have been considered to be representative or reliable? Um, well, this conclusion is obviously based upon the information that we had and, and the survey returns that we'd had. And as I say, I think part of the discussion would have been um, which authorities had actually responded as well, because obviously some have you know, much bigger areas of um, responsibility and many more buildings than, than others. Did you yourself consider at the time that such a limited data set was appropriate as the basis for a government-funded experimental testing programme of such importance to fire safety? I'm sure we would have discussed this, as I said, at the time, yes. Yes, yes. You, you, said, you said that. I, I just want to know whether you yourself, in your own head, thought that this limited data set was safe and sufficient. Um, I would have been guided by the discussions that had happened and, and whether... As I say, I think a key, a key element of that would be who had responded in terms of the local authorities, et cetera, um, well, as well. Which, and if the department had considered that this was adequate to move forwards, then that's what we would have done. I'm not quite answering my question. I'd like to know your own view at the time. Did you yeah. think that this data set was sufficient and safe, or did you not? I must have been convinced that, that it was OK to continue. Who convinced you? Well, I'd have been convinced by the information that was being presented to me and, um, you know, the fact that we were going to proceed to the experimental programme. Were you convinced by the nature of the data or were you convinced by um, a person being persuasive? I don't recall. I mean, it would have been a bit of both, I think. Right. And, and can you explain, if you considered it yourself, why it was that such a limited data set... Uh, was adequate for this purpose? Um, well, I guess as well, factored into all of this would have been that there was some degree of time imperative in proceeding based upon the pressure that the department was probably under from the select committee. And, you know, you could, in an ideal world, say, well, we're going to spend, you know, considerable length of time to try to... Um, get more responses back, and I'm sure a lot of effort would have been put into tra chasing up questionnaires and responses anyway, um, but you reach a point where you have to decide whether you have enough information and you're going to progress, or you're not. Yes, thank you. Mr Chairman, is that a convenient moment? I think it is, yes. It's time we had a break, isn't it, okay. uh, Dr Smith? We'll stop now. We'll resume at quarter to 12, please. Okay. And again, please don't talk to anyone about your evidence while you're out of the room. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Go off to twelve, please.
Would you ask Dr. Smith to come back in, please? All right, Dr. Smith. Yes, thank you. All right, let's keep going. Yes, Mr. Mellis. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Dr. Smith, if we can please carry on with the document we were on, BRE 3041887. And let's go to page 10, please. You can see there, there's a heading, Fire Breaks. Uh, and in the second sentence of that paragraph underneath it, it says, uh, the use of fire barriers appears to be very sporadic, and typical responses included only fitted when asked or unknown. Just focusing on that sentence, did that cause you concern at the time? Um, I suppose the fact that it's mentioned there is a flag that, yes, there, there are issues around the use of fire yeah. barriers. I mean, it's right, isn't it, that at this point, cavity barriers had been recommended for more than a decade by approved document. Correct. Being, yeah. Do you know whether any action was taken in response to this um, uh, finding? Um, I don't know if any action was taken at that particular time. No, no, I you don't. You don't know? You didn't no. follow up or seek to find out whether action was being taken? No. Why is that? Um, this was a finding of the research, and the research obviously was um, only part way through. Mm. Did you have any discussions that you can recall about that topic with Anthony Bird or Brian Martin? Um, I don't recall. You don't recall? No. Do you know whether Sarah Colwell was involved in any such discussions with them or with you about this topic? I don't know whether Sarah would have discussed it with them or not. Uh, I mean, the fact, sorry, just, just to say, I mean, Brian obviously was part of this research anyway, so Brian would have been aware of this. Right. Yes. Yes. Uh, can we then go to page 12 and look uh, under the heading procurement uh, at the second paragraph there? It says this. It is evident that the insulation industry has a number of highly active lobbying groups. The approach taken by the two main factions, the mineral wool manufacturers and the polymeric core suppliers, has been one of the highly aggressive marketing, has been one of highly aggressive marketing against their opposition. This has led to several articles in the construction press. What was the basis for those observations? Um, I can't recall the specifics, but um, I mean, I guess we were aware of some activity in, in the construction press, as this says. Mm. Do you know to which manufacturers this report was referring there? Um, I, it was more likely to refer to um, the trade associations associated with, very, you know, the different uh, generic types of manufacturers. Right. The factions that are identified are manufacturers on the one hand and suppliers on the other, not trade associations. Do you know who the manufacturers there and the suppliers there were? N not at this point in time, no, I don't. Later? No, I mean, sat here today, I, I can't right. recall, sorry. Do you know whether the department was given the identity or knew the identity of the companies this report was referring to here? I would imagine they probably were, yes. Did, but you, don't, you didn't have any discussion about this, this factionalisation? Um, not me personally. Uh, who then at the BRE, can you help? Um, well, again, it, it could very well have been um, Brian Martin and or Sarah Cowell. Right. Now let's look at uh, the next paragraph on that same page. It says this, should the department choose to partner these companies for the supply and installation of their products for this project, they should be aware of this background. Experience suggests that the industry sector will wish to ensure the maximum publicity from this work to the detriment of their opposition. And this may prove difficult to manage. In addition, it is important to ensure that the work is independent and free from undue commercial influence, which is difficult to control when partnering with industry. Whilst we are happy to work with these organisations, it may be more politically expedient to purchase the materials and services on the open market in order to ensure that a level playing field is maintained in the marketplace. Now, the companies, of course, manufacturers uh, and uh, suppliers are not named in the report. W was it your understanding that the department would need to know who they were in order to, to be informed properly when making decisions on partnering with industry for the supply of products for the project? Um, yes, and I'm sure those discussions would have taken place. R why are you so sure? 
because they would want to understand what the background to this would be. Were you, uh, coming back to the point, were you party to those discussions? Not that I can recall. Right. What, what was the experience that suggested that industry would seek to ensure maximum publicity from any partnership to the detriment of their opposition, as it says here? Um, well, that's not terribly unusual, really. Um, with the industry at large, it's not just, I think, the um, insulation industry. Um, you get the same sort of um, tendencies in, in other sectors as well. If, if they see a result that is particularly favourable in their view to their particular type of product, then they will seek to um, gain marketing advantage from that. So, you know, and especially if it is done under a government contract, you know, as shown in government research carried out by whoever, BRE or whoever else it might be, um, because, you know, they regard that with a higher degree of kudos. Was it your own experience that it was difficult to control the independence of work and keep it free from undue commercial influence when partnering with industry? Um, it's more difficult if you're partnering with them, where you're relying on them to basically supply products and materials. Whereas, I mean, as proposed here, if you go to the open market and use an independent third party to procure directly from suppliers um, and building yes. um, suppliers, then you, you, you've got product that is actually take, taken out of the market yeah, I see that. in the supply uh, chain. Do, do you know uh, whether uh, products for this programme were actually purchased on the open market? I believe they were, yes. And that's probably as a consequence of these observations. Right. And looking at this paragraph and hearing your answers just now, Dr Smith, can we take it from that that as early as 2000, you, or the BRE certainly, had a good reason to be sceptical of the manufacturers in the insulation industry? Um, well, and other factions within the construction industry right. in general. To, to the extent that youth saw fit to warn government that those manufacturers, and perhaps others, may try to influence research for their own financial benefit in a way which might be difficult to control. Um, yes, especially at this particular time, because I say I think there was a lot going on at the, that time, um, as evidenced by articles in the construction press at the time. And what was, just give us a hint of what that was, what was going on that might aggravate or exacerbate the attempts by manufacturers and suppliers to influence the research in that way? Um, not necessarily to um, influence the research, but in terms of, you know, the, the aggressive marketing that, that, that was um, evident at the time. Now, sticking with this document, I want to ask you some questions about the experimental testing programme. Uh, if we stick with page 12, you can see lower down the page, if you scroll down, there's option one, file note nine, um, and that says, from the information provided in the survey and in order to, to address the trend towards increasing thermal and acoustic performance in the residential housing market, the following experimental programme is proposed. This option does not provide any indication of the performance of built-up systems or preformed insulation panels. The tests would be carried out in accordance with BRE Fire Note 9 using the existing test facility at BRE Cardington. You see that? Yes. And then if we just read down, you can see the system type 1 with U values, and that has set 1 rendered systems uh, under which, and there's no fire barriers, standard fixing, no, no fire barriers, standard fixings, tests 1, 2, and 3, mineral fibre, expanded polystyrene, and phenolic, respectively. And then you repeat that again with fire barriers. And then if we turn the page, system type two, equivalent U value for system type one, uh, ventilated range screen, no fire barriers. Test one, metal faced panel or metal rail. Test two, non combustible panel on wooden battens, mineral fiber insulation. Test three, class naught panel, metal rails, mineral fiber insulation. Test four, class naught panel on wooden batten, mineral fiber insulation. And then you repeat the set test three and four with fire barriers. And I've taken that quite quickly. Um, 
and then there are some costings at the bottom of each of those options. Who designed that testing programme? Do you remember? Um, I don't recall, but I, I would anticipate that that was done by the project team, which would have um, obviously been Sarah Colwell, um, Brian Martin, and others involved in you know, the, the project on a day-to-day -day basis. Right. And what was your own involvement? Um, I wouldn't have had any involvement in the design of the, the experimental programme and the options, right. other than um, being asked, I guess, at some point to approve the report. Do you know how the various components were chosen? Um, no, I don't. Do you know what the technical or practical rationale for choosing these products, and in particular the particular cladding configurations was? Um, no, I don't. I mean, I guess it would have been guided in principle by the responses to the questionnaire and so on as well. Right. Can we look at page 13, please? Which is option two, modified file note nine. Uh, as you can see there, there's a long text underneath that, and it says at the start, during discussions, and then there's an end note eight, which mm -hmm. I'm going to come to, during discussions, it has become increasingly obvious that there are several issues relating to the use of built-up systems and preformed insulation panels that should be addressed as part of this project. It should also be noted that the Joint British Standards Committee working on the Fire Note 9 test method is recommended that a part two of the standard be developed to address the testing of built-up preformed insulation where no masonry wall is present and curtain wall systems. We currently have no experience of their fire behaviour in this scenario. Now, according to end note 8, if you go, please, to page 15, the discussions that are identified there in that first line of that paragraph are said, if you look at 8, to have taken place at a meeting at DETR on the 24th of July 2000. Do you recall that meeting? I don't. You, you can't tell us who attended or what was discussed? No. Do you know whether it was minuted by the BRE? I don't know. You haven't seen a minute? No, I haven't. I mean, at that time when the framework management contractors were in place, it would be normal if they, if they were present for them to basically take some notes, right. actions at least. It may help you, but the meeting of the 24th of July 2000 is the same day that this document gets signed off. Do you remember having a meeting very, very close? No, it probably indicates that I was not involved in, in that meeting. Do you know what the issues were relating to the use of built-up systems and preformed insulation panels that should be addressed as part of that project, as it no, says? No, I don't. Now, it's right to think that the Joint British Standards Committee, which is referred to, uh, was working on the conversion of uh, Fire Note 9 into what eventually became BS 8414 Part 1, and then Part 2. Yes. Yes. Um, go back, can we, if we can, please, to page 13. There are two paragraphs I want to read to you next. Um, the, the, the second and the third paragraphs on that page under option two. The second paragraph says, the major change between the existing test method and the second scenario discussed above is the influence of an internal masonry wall. The existing test facility is designed with this internal wall in place. This is an inappropriate test scenario for the built-up and preformed insulation systems that are installed in practice, without an internal masonry wall. In order to address this issue, the test facility will need to be redesigned. From the work undertaken in the 1997 PIT <laughs> project, we have some limited knowledge of the behavior of proprietary ventilated rain screen systems, and we are aware of some work under a DOE contract 399370CC972, but we do not have access to this data, so no comment can be made on its suitability for use in this study. Now, PIT, that's Partners in Technology, isn't it? Um, yes. If we go back to page 15, if we can, please, we can see end note 11, which is what's uh, signified by the reference to the, that, that project. And it says there, under end note 11, that that was, um, it says, Colwell S, Smith D, Andrews A, Connolly R, Fire Note 3, test method to assess the fire performance of external cladding systems, BRE 1996. Um, that's Fire Note 3, isn't it? Uh, yes, it appears so. Do you know what specific work undertaken in the 1997 PIT project is being referred to here? No, I don't. Do you know who carried out that work? Um, the authors as listed would have all been involved in that project, and that would have all been headed up by um, Tony Morris. 
uh, as a result of that project, the 1997 PIT project, what was your knowledge about the behaviour of proprietary ventilated rain screen systems? At that time, in 1996, I would have had no knowledge at all. What about by 2000 and the time of this document? Um, my knowledge in 2000 would have been based upon um, the work that was being undertaken under this contract. Right. Uh, I see. And what about the um, evidence given to the select committee? The I wasn't involved in that at all. Do you know in what way the knowledge was limited, as is said? Um, I guess they're referring to the possibility that they hadn't tested any of those types of systems and therefore had no knowledge as to how they would perform in this kind of scenario. I see. Uh, and was DOE contract 393370 the contract which led to Fire Note 3? I don't know. You don't know. After this report, um, did you obtain access to the data under that contract? Um, Just to see for yourself what it said. No, I wouldn't have done. Why's I that? would have expected the project team to have been utilising that if it was available, but I think they've said in this report that it wasn't available, didn't they, on that previous page? Going back, please, if we can, to page 13, it says, except at the foot of the page, accepting the budgetary constraints associated with this project, the large-scale experimental programme may be better served by considering a modification to Fire Note 9 to allow built-up systems and preformed insulation panels to be tested. In order to undertake this change in test scenario, a new test facility would be required. The construction of such a facility would reduce the budget available for the purchase and supply of full-scale systems, but would provide a good basis on which to expand the scope of the existing guidance given BR135 to cover the emerging market trends for which we currently have no data. This data could also be used to support the British standards activity. It is not possible to offer fixed budgetary figures for this option, but should this proposal be considered worthy of further consideration, a costing could be obtained. Now, given the lack of data on emerging market trends, as we saw from the survey, and given the, that the data could also support the conversion of Fire Note 9 into a British standard running in parallel with this work, as I think you told us, mm -hmm. did you rec yourself recommend to the department that they should proceed with option two? I don't recall. You don't recall. What, which was the option that you would have preferred the department to take? Um, I mean, from our perspective, I think it was just important to outline what the options were so that they had the information to make their decision. I mean, it would not, you know, we, we were just using the information that we had to say, well, th this is what you, can, what you can do. You can go this route or you can go this route. And it's, it's up to you whether you want to expand the scope um, along the lines that's being proposed in, yeah. in option two or not. I mean, I, I don't think I would have particularly had a, um, a preference, as you, as you suggest. Was option two for, for the testing programme given consideration or further consideration by the department? I'm sure it would have been given consideration. Was it ever costed by the BRE? Um, I don't recall. Now, it, it's right to think, isn't it, that the testing programme which was eventually undertaken and then reported as part of this project was different both from option one and from option two are set out in the report we've been looking at. Um, I don't recall all the details, but if, if, that's, um, if that's what you're telling me, yes. Well, we'll look at, we'll, we'll look at the details very shortly, but do, do you remember the, that fact that, that the, the testing programme eventually undertaken the, the, the following year was different from what was proposed? I don't recall it specifically, but right. you know, that, do you that could very well be the case. I'm so sorry. You, yes. yes. Do you recall that a full, a full total of 14 full-scale tests was carried out with a third set of tests on composite panel systems included? Um, in broad terms, yes. yes. Do you know how the testing programme that was eventually carried out decided upon? Um, well, it would have been a discussion with the project team and the department. Yes, um, clear, clearly. But what were the factors that led to the, the that led to the decision to carry out the testing program in the form in which it was? I don't know the details. I don't know the detailed discussion that took place. And by whom was the decision 
ultimately taken to carry out the test programme in the form that it was? Um, well, ultimately, it would have been signed off by the department. Do you know who? No. Do you know when it happened? By which I mean, was the ultimate programme decided before the tests began, or did it change, did it evolve as the tests happened over the months between May and November 2001? I don't recall. Uh, let's just look at a document if we can. Can we go to BRE 406285? This is an email uh, from Sarah Colwell to Anthony Bird of the 10th of August 2001, and you'll see that <coughs> you are copied in on it, as is Peter Field. This is um, during the course of what became known as the CC 1924 testing program. And j just looking at the text, I'm not going to read it all out to you, um, it... it it, it essentially says that um, this is a proposal for changes to the testing programme sometime after it had begun. Okay. Do you remember that? Not specifically, but yes, I can see this. Yeah. And if, if we look at the final three paragraphs on page two of this email, if we go to that, I think you can see that Sarah Colwell is proposing changes to the testing programme at this point, August 2001, yes? Yes. Yes. Um, now, in terms of the suggested options for the full-scale testing, which we'll come back to, the rendered systems, which was set one, test two and three, weren't all repeated with fire barriers. Take that from me. Okay. Um, do you know why that is? Um, specifically, no, I don't. Um, it may have been a case of there was a fixed budget that the department had to spend on this work and that in order to undertake some different types of tests. They needed to, you know, reduce the amount of tests they did right. elsewhere, but I, I don't specifically know. You don't know. And it, t take it from me also that the ventilated rain screen system tests in set two, tests three and four, were also both not repeated with fire barriers. Was, was that for the same reason, so far as you can attribute Yeah, again, I, I don't know specifically. In fact, uh, and we'll come back to it in, in detail shortly, but it, it's right, isn't it, that the, of the full-scale tests undertaken, all 14 of them, only two, one render and one rain screen system, actually contained fire barriers. Um, that could very well be true. And is the reason for that financial, um, to the best of your recollection? Probably. Probably. Let's then go to the test... Um, program analysis report. This is BRE 3041882. And if we go to page one of that document, it's a client report prepared for Mr. A. Bird in the ODPM. And you can see the date at the bottom, 19th of September 2002. Yes. That, that, that's an important date, and I'll call this the analysis report, okay, and that's the 19th of September. And if we go to page two, we can see that it was prepared by Sarah Colwell uh, and approved by you, Dr. Smith. Correct. Yes. If we go to page five, we see the introduction section. Uh, and if you look at the second paragraph and the five bullet points under it, it tells us that 14 full-scale fire tests were undertaken. Using the Fire Note 9 test methodology, the results from this work are presented in BRE Report 209169, Revision 1. The systems identified and tested at full scale were also assessed at intermediate and bench scale using the following test methods. And then you've got uh, the BS 476 Part 6 and 7 tests, uh, and th three uh, of the um, European norm tests, the EN tests. You see that? Yes. Uh, now, before, before we go through these, um, the intermediate and bench scale tests, what are those? Um, the single burning item test. Right. The um, BSEN ISO 11925 um, part two, and the BS four seven six part six and seven. Right. So all of those except for the ISO nine seven zero five. Yeah. 
Now, just for clarity, if we turn to page 10 in table 1, we see a summary of the systems tested at intermediate and bench scale. Page 10. And it refers to 13 systems. Now, there's a, there may be a reason for that, and I just want to see if you can help me with it. Um, if we go to page 23 and look at table 8, Um, the only difference between tests 3 and 4 under set 2 render systems, you see those, yeah. is the provision or otherwise of fire barriers, yes? Yes. Yes. And, and f is it right, fire barriers, of course, can't be incorporated into intermediate and bench scale tests, can they? Correct. And that, does that explain why there are only 13 systems in, uh, in table 1 on page 10, which summarises the intermediate and, and bench scale results? Yes, that will be the case. Yes, thank you. Now, do you remember when did this testing programme begin? I can't recall that. We have it at about June 2001, possibly May, but does that, does that ring a bell with you? Um, yeah, I, I don't know. Right. What was your role in the testing programme? Um, as far as I can recollect, I, I'm in no role. I, I wasn't carrying out the tests, if that's what you mean. Were, were you supervising Sarah Colwell's work? Um, insofar as um, she might want to come and discuss issues with me, flag things up, but um, the actual tests would have been carried out by the testing teams in, in the laboratories that are expert and competent to do so. Yeah. Did you supervise any aspect of that? Um, no. Did you supervise any aspect of the production of the results from the tests, or their collation, um, or their analysis? Only insofar as I would have reviewed this when I reviewed the report. Does that tell us that your only involvement in this was approving this document? That would have predominantly been my involvement, unless we'd have had some you know, discussions leading up to this. Well, when you sat down and applied your name as approver to this document, what did you have in front of you, other than the report itself? Um, I don't recall, but, yeah, I don't recall. Did, did, did you ha no, not specifically. Let me ask it differently. Did you have anything else on your desk when you were approving this document, other than this document? Yeah, I, I don't recall. I, I don't know. Would it have been your usual practice to examine the underlying test data for each of these 14 tests uh, and check the conclusions that Sarah Colwell had reached? Um, no, not necessarily. Not, not to have gone through every single, you know, BS 476 test report, for example. What did the role of approver then of, of this report involve? Well, because, and the reason I wouldn't do that is because in producing a BS 476 Part 7 test report, for example, then that would go through its own approvals process before it was delivered to the end client, and if that, even if that's an internal client within BRE. So Sarah would have received approved test reports and, you know, the, the role, there would be no need for me to go back and re-approve something that had already gone through an approvals process. So what did, your, what did you actually do with this document? I would have reviewed this document as submitted to me. So you read it and signed it? And query anything, pass comments. I mean, as I said earlier, that the whole role of the approver is basically to, to read the document, to check for um, spelling mistakes, check for paragraphs, make sure it all reads and makes sense. Um, if anything doesn't make sense or isn't clear, <coughs> then that might lead to um, well, comments being fed back or a discussion. Or if any of the, the conclusions didn't appear to stack up or be supported by the evidence as presented. Um, so your review as approver was limited to the four corners of this, of this document? Pre it's predominantly it would have been, um, but, but, and, unless something, you know, had cropped up that had 
prompted me to go and look at other other information. Do, do you remember whether there was anything that cropped up that prompted you to go and look at other information? I don't recall that. Not now. Wasn't your role on this project to uh, in, in, ensure quality, ensure the technical detail of the outputs uh, and the timeliness of the delivery? On this project, yes. Yes, as yes. director of Centre for Reaction to Fire. Yes. Yeah. I would like to look then at the 14 full-scale tests o on the assumption from the evidence you've just given us that you would have read or did read this document carefully, yes? Yes. Yes. Now, f as I say from the documents we've, we've got, it looks as if the tests were carried out at various times in the months between the end of May, beginning of June 2001, and the 14th of November 2001. Uh, but on occasions, more than one test was carried out within a single day. Does that sound about right to you? Um, it could be, yes. Right. Um, were you actually present at any of the large-scale tests? I don't recall being present, no. Right. Do you know who were present? Well, clearly the project team would have been, and so the technicians that, that would have been um, running, running those tests. Right. Sarah Colwell told us, day 232, page 82, line 20, that um, although she couldn't tell us which tests you attended, uh, you and Brian Martin would have been present at some of the, or all of the large-scale tests. What do you say about that? I don't recall being present at any of the large-scale tests, right. personally. Um, and I would have no, no reason to be particularly. I would have no no role to play in conducting those tests. Um, and I think it's also important to point out that you, you, know, you can't just, because of the proximity of Cardington to, um, to BRE, it was at least a half day to get there and get back. So it would have to be you know, a planned visit. You couldn't just sort of walk out of your office and pop down to the lab to see a test and, and return. So, um, you know, and, and given that the project team would, be, would have been in attendance, mm. I, I would have added very little value to, um, to the project team at that time. Well, as director of the Centre for Reaction to Fire at the time, and given that this was a government project for which you had bid, and successfully so, did, it not, did you not think it appropriate on one or two occasions just to attend at Cardington for the, the half day in, in a supervisory role, just to see what was going on and making, making sure that everything was working properly? Well, I would have attended if I'd been asked to for a specific problem. But if reassured that everything was on track and was going well, then I would have no, no reason to, um, to deviate from that. But I say I do not recall, I cannot recall um, whether I, I saw any of the tests or not, but I don't recall actually going up there and, and, and witnessing them. Does that tell us that your role as supervisor of this project was essentially a, 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 a reactive one you would respond to negative reporting, but you didn't positively go out and see for yourself what was happening. Um, I mean, we would meet um, on a reasonably regular basis to review progress, um, but that would have been in the context of, you know, are we on track? How are we, um, how are we doing? Do we need additional resources to deliver this? And, and so on and so forth. Now, I'd like to show you a different document of three days before this document, which is the BRE's closing report dated the 16th of September 2002. That is at BRE 3041895. Uh, again, it's prepared for Mr. A. Bird of the ODPM, and you can see the date there, 16th of September 2002, at the bottom of your screen. If we go to page nine, please, we can see a list of the 14 full-scale tests which were carried out with a description of the main components of the systems in each test. Do you know why the specific products aren't identified by reference to the product name and manufacturer? Um, I think this relates to 
the standard practice with pretty much all of the government projects that actually I've ever been involved in. Um, it's always been a requirement to describe the products in a very generic way um, rather than using specific trade names and um, manufacturer's descriptions. And I think the, the possibly the reasoning behind that is to try to give the um, most widely applicable scope where possible and to prevent the, um, the industry being able to use the data in the way that we discussed earlier. Do you actually know, or did the BRE actually know the identity of the specific products and manufacturers, le leaving aside the absence of identification in this document? Um, I don't recall, but I'll be very surprised if we didn't. Well, I ask you that because the inquiry has asked both BRE and the department for their records and have been told there aren't any. And Dr. Colwell couldn't help when she was asked about it. But can you confirm that the, at the time that information was known to the BRE? As I say, I, I would be surprised if it wasn't. Right. Um, but I can't say definitively no. one way or the other. No, of course. Do you know how and where that information was recorded? Um, from my recollection, I think this project, as we discussed earlier, was the, the systems were procured through um, an independent third party contractor. Um, yes. So there would have been specifications um, generated by him or them, sorry. In, in, indeed, but my question was slightly different. Do you know how and where the information was recorded in, in the BRE's files? All oh, right. Um, no, I don't for sure. Right. Now, we looked earlier at the advice given by the BRE to the department in the survey summary and options report, uh, uh, particularly about the dangers of partnering with industry. Do you know whether by this time the department had decided to follow that advice or not? Um, yes, insofar as this project, I, I, I don't think we were partnering with industry. As I say, I think all the procurement was done through an independent third party contractor. And who funded the full scale testing? Um, the, the government department, right. um, ODPM. All of it? Yes. So can you confirm that no manufacturers or industry organisations were involved in funding any of these tests? As far yeah. as I'm aware. Right. Did you yourself have any involvement in the process of purchasing or obtaining any of the products to be tested? Um, I don't recall, but it's likely that I would have signed off the requisitions because we had a, you know, limits in terms of how much you could, uh, you know, sign off a, a requisition for, and indeed some of those may have been above my sign off limit as well. So they may have then gone up to Peter Field to sign. Right. And do you remember whether in requisitioning you would identify a particular product or just a particular uh, performance standard? Um, it would have related to um, at least a generic description of the system and then there would have been a discussion because we'd have, we'd have known in order to issue a requisition you would know how much it was going to cost roughly. And uh, <clears throat> if we go please then to BRE 406370. This is an email between Sarah Colwell, you, uh, sort of like, wait till it comes up on the screen. This is an email from Sarah Colwell to you on the 15th of March, 2002. So this looks like it's after the tests for it, uh, 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 asking you about the drafted text to Mike Payne. Mm -hmm. Do you know who Mike Payne was? Yes, Mike Payne was the um, one of the people that were working for AEA Technology at the time, who were the approved, um, the appointed third-party contractor that ran the management of the frameworks on behalf of ODPM. And if you look at the text below it, uh, 
there's a telephone conversation in the first paragraph. And in the second paragraph, it says, the provision of material for this project lies outside the framework agreement. And from the outset, we have undertaken to procure and supply the materials for this project on an at-cost basis. The initial materials estimate supplied to you is the best estimate available at the time when the project was being developed. As the project has gone on, we have continued to procure the materials and services required to complete this project whilst passing all invoices to yourselves directly. To date, the invoices received and forwarded to you total £117,570.25p ex VAT. This covers all materials supplied, installed and tested to date to meet the requirements of this contract. This covers all full-scale tests, but only the rain screen and composite panel systems at small scale and ISO room. Now, is it right, looking at that, at least, that it was the BRE who, who bought the product for the testing but passed the bills back to AET? Um, yes, it does look like that. So it would be the BRE who then actually chose the specific products to be tested? Yes, but that would have been agreed, as I say, up front as in terms of the programme of work to be undertaken. And do you know who it was who identified the precise specific projects to be acquired? Um, no, I don't. Uh, it says projects in the question, and that is what I said. I meant product. Yes. No. Um, can you help on what level of oversight and decision-making you had about the components of each school full-scale test? Um, very little. Sarah Colwell tells us, which is why I ask you, that the procurement of the components of the systems to be tested would have gone through you. That was day 232, page 88, line 1. Is she right about that? Um, only insofar as, in terms of signing them off, um, the, the invoices off, as described here, in terms of the procurement. So, I say, there would have been discussions, I'm sure, with the um, contractor who was procuring these um, within the scope of what was set out in the reports to the department where it had been discussed which systems in generic terms they wanted to test um, and then we would have gone to the contractor to provide us with a price for those which would have then been um, agreed and signed off and, and that's where I would have signed off to say yes we can buy that um, and then that would have been sent back um, to the department and I hadn't um, remembered, but the, the actual external expenditure part of this project then sat outside of the framework agreement. So the framework agreement and the project within that then only covered our staff time in carrying out the works rather than the purchase of all of the, the materials. Did the department have any role to play in the selection of the individual components making up each of the full-scale tests? Um, I don't know to what extent, I mean, they would have done in a, in a general sense. What do you mean in a general sense? Well, when you talk about specific components, I mean, they wouldn't, and I guess we didn't either, have a particular role in saying that you need to use you know, the, these battens and fixed at these centres and so on and so forth. But in terms of the makeup, in terms of the insulation and the render system or the rain screen system or whatever, then, then they would have seen that and would have agreed to that. Do you know who designed the test rigs for each of these 14 tests? The systems to actually go onto the rig yes. in terms of securing it onto the rig, it would have been the contractor. The contractor being? The, the third party that procured the, the materials. I'm, I'm, I, it was right. one and the same. Just, just help me then. The, a, is this AET? No. So who was the contractor? No. So we, we appointed an independent third party contractor to undertake the procurement and the installation of the systems onto the rig. AEA Technology were the contractor used by ODPM and appointed by ODPM as their, I think he was, they, they were called their research management contractor. Mm. And they acted as the interface, the people that basically agreed and accepted reports, um, let the contracts. Um, they had a, a portal, a database, where all of the reports and so on had to be delivered through. So they dealt with the day-to-day -day running of the projects from the department's end. Who was your contractor? 
our external contractor. Who built the who designed the rigs? Yeah, I don't know. Right. I'm sure there must be something in the, or I would have thought there'd be something in the documents that we've provided to you. Now, the full-scale tests were designed <coughs> and carried out according to the methodology in Fire Note 9, as we understand it. Is that right? That's my understanding. Can we go to BRE 304182, please? <coughs> on the screen, but we need to go in that to page 23. Um, this is the 19th of September report, the analysis report. And here we see a table at page 23, summary of full-scale test results, table 8. Uh, and, and if you look at the table, it's, um, it contains the 14 tested systems listed, and the results are in the far right-hand column, yes? Uh, yes. Final 9, pass, fail. Yes. And you can see from that final column that three of the 14 tests resulted in a pass. See yes. that? Yes. They are, they are render tests four and five and composite panels test four. Yes? Uh, yes. And all the others failed? Yes. So two of the systems which passed were in set two, as, as initially proposed, render systems. Yes? Uh, yes. And only one passed from set three, the composite panels. Yes. And only one, and no, no <coughs> passes in set one, the rain screen panels. They all failed, didn't they? Uh, yes. Now, I want to ask you briefly about uh, um, something in the documents. Keeping page 23 up on the screen, if we can, I wonder if you can help us with this. Can we please have up BRE 3041912? Now, this is going to have to be in the native and may take a little bit of time to pull up. It's an Excel spreadsheet which shows the same or more or less the same data as in Table 8. And if we open it, If we can open it up, please, and keep it on the left-hand side, I think that'll do. Um, it's right, I think. Can you help us? This is an Excel spreadsheet showing the same data as in Table 8 on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, it appears so. It appears I can so. only see two columns, but yes. so I can't uh, see the product descriptions. Well, no, that's yeah. Sheet 8. But let's, um, let's go to... Um, if you look at Table 8, um, you can see uh, there are two render passes. But in the spreadsheet on the left, uh, you can see uh, that there are three. You see that? Three passes on the render spreadsheet. That's the group at the top, I yes. assume. So assuming that's the, the group at the top, yes, yes, it's in a different order. To it is. And, and let's look at row six, which is identified as a pass. Yes. Now, that's a test on a render system which incorporates phenolic. And we can see that that same test is recorded in, on the, in the table on the right hand of your screen, as you see, as a fail. Can you see that? Line one, is it on the? Uh, it, it's row six. But on in table eight, it's row one, is it? In table eight. Yes. Uh, it is. Uh, yes. Specimen one, under render systems. <coughs> yes. Phenolic insulation with acrylic render coat, no fire barriers. Yes. Do you know? Can you explain why? Can you explain the discrepancy? Uh, no, not sat here right now. Are you able to confirm that the particular test rendered with phenolic was in fact a fail? Um, I would presume so. Yes, and why, why would you presume so? Um, because that's the way it's been reported. Right. Uh, and did somebody therefore look at the spreadsheet uh, and correct the result, say that what I went to government in the uh, analysis report is, can be taken as the correct version? I would have expected so, yes, yes. I, but Thank I don't you. recall. 
Now, thank you. Now, let's go back then to the uh, the closing report at BRE 30 41895, page 9. Could take both of those documents off the screen and go back to that document, please. BRE 30 41895, page 9. Here we have the... Um, uh, the ex initial experimental program under table one, and you can see under the heading rain screen systems, you see that? Yes. Um, you've got, uh, which is set two, you've got item five, aluminium sheets, yes? Yes. Do you know the name of the aluminium sheet product? No, I or, don't. Or the manufacturer, presumably not? No. No. Is it the case that these panels were in fact aluminium panels with a polyethylene core? Um, I believe they were from the earlier document that you presented. Yes. Yeah. Indeed, they were one of the types of panels referred to in the literature review we've looked at, taken from the architectural journal. Yes. Yes. Good. So let me, let's go um, to the analysis report of three days later then. BRE 30 is 41882. Just trace this through. If we go to that document... This is only three days later, as I say. Uh, and go to page 10 and table 1 in that, and look down uh, uh, at um, the results there, uh, at the um, systems there. Table 1, item 5 under the heading rain screen, you can see a bit more detail, and it says aluminium stroke polyethylene core sheets. Yes? Yes. And, and then tracing it through to BRE... Three zero is four one nine zero nine. We find a, a blank tabulated summary for all the testing results, and that in the final row under the ra heading under the heading rain screen, you see the description: aluminium polyethylene core sheets on aluminium railing. Now, Dr. Colwell said that that product was ACM with a polyethylene core, uh, and I think you would agree with that. Yes. Yes. That, that was day 23290 at 21 and day 23291 at 19. Do you remember being present at that test, the test which incorporated aluminium polyethylene core sheets on an aluminium railing? No, I don't. Now, um, the date of that test, according to the inquiry's records, was the 18th of July 2001. Does that trigger a, a recollection? No. No, it doesn't. Now, uh, this test was, was notable in terms of its fire performance, and, and in particular the early manual termination of before six minutes was up. Do you recall that? No. Did you not hear about that from others? Um, I'm sure I would have um, heard about all of the tests in, in summary during various discussions, you know, in, in, in broad terms. Can we go to BR? Yes, so sorry. No, go on. Sorry. Right. Can we go to BRE three zero four one nine one two, please? I'm so sorry. I know this will take a bit of time. Um, easier and quicker to go back to table eight in in the nineteenth of September analysis report. If we can do that which is a BRE three zeros. Well, we're here now. <laughs> All right. Uh, leave it as it is. Um, if, if you open that up uh, uh, at row 15, column R, column R in row 15, you can see uh, uh, the termination time at 5.75 minutes, yes? Yes. So, you, so you, that, that was one which was terminated very early on. Yes. And if you look to the left of that, you can see some other results. Time to external under column L, three minutes, uh, and, um, and the maximum temperatures also received, uh, recorded. Yes. Uh, those are strikingly poor, weren't they? The times are, yes. Yeah. And we'll come back to that in a moment, but just, just some f further questions about the selection 
of this, these products. Do you know why an ACM polyethylene cord product was chosen as one of the products to be tested in this programme? I don't recall, but looking back at the earlier report that we looked at earlier this morning, um, in terms of the um, survey responses, etc., my guess is that it followed through the, the planning and the, the programme from, from there. Right. Does that tell us that however good or bad the survey was in, in relation to its reliability as a data set, you knew enough uh, to, to, to include ACM panels with a polyethylene core in your full-scale tests? Yes, because this is a research project, so you're looking to basically include a range of different products and materials yes. to basically... Um, well, test their performance because a lot of these, as we also spoke about, we had no knowledge of how they would perform in these types of scenarios. Um, and that was particularly true of the composite and rain screen systems. Um, and, and therefore you want to sort of include a, a, a range of uh, systems that, that you can obtain data on so that you can then look at how the test is performing against these types of products and it gives a basis upon which to benchmark performance mm -hmm. and whether they're adequate or not. You know, if the test get, gave passes for everything, you would take the view, well, the test isn't severe enough. Right. Do you know who decided on the inclusion of ACM panels with a polyethylene core in this test programme? No, I don't. Can we take it that the, that the reason or one of the reasons it was included in this test programme is that um, ACM panels with a polyethylene core was in common use or at least common enough use to warrant inclusion? Um, I don't know whether we would have had that information other than it had been flagged up, I think, in the, um, in the literature um, the, the building survey, sorry, not the literature review. Yeah. Well, that was included in there. And based on the architect, architect's journals, yes. postings. Yes, and obviously that, there was a, a vast number of different products that came out of the architect's journal um, mm. details, and obviously all of those products could not be tested anyway, so it was a case of selecting a few, but I don't know who actually made that. Was ACM with a polyethylene core, or indeed ACM with different kinds of core, a cladding product that you'd come across before? Um, no. No. Can we take it from that, that you had no knowledge one way or the other of its particular reaction to fire performance? Correct. Now, you said you don't recall being present at the test. Um, I'd just like to go back, please, if we can, to... We, we could probably use this document, um, but I'd, it may be better to use the r report that was actually sent to government. Can we go, please, to the analysis report of the 19th of September at BRE 3014882, page 23, which is the results table at table eight. That's uh, BRE three zeros four one eight eight two, page twenty three. Uh, there it is. Now, um, if you go, please, to row five under the heading rain screen systems. That shows, as I've shown you already, that that failed at 5.75 minutes. Uh, that's a, a, a strikingly rapid time to failure, isn't it? Yes. Do you remember what the reaction was by the BRE at the time to that result? Um, I don't recall, no. Do you remember what you were time. told by those who witnessed this test? Um, probably that it was a, a rapid failure um, and they would have presumably had the same view about the render system that failed and also the um, composite panel system that failed. And we can see the other results on the screen. Time to external failure, three minutes, and to internal failure, 4.34 minutes. Yes. Do you know why the test was terminated at 5.75 minutes? No. Did nobody tell you that it was terminated because it would have been dangerous to continue? 
Um, I mean, that's, that's... No, I don't know. No. Did anybody tell you that they were shocked by what they'd seen and shocked by the results? I don't recall that. No. That was Sarah Colwell's reaction, as she mm. told us in her evidence on day 232 at page 96, line 16. Did, do you not recall her reporting to you uh, that this particular test had had a shocking uh, outcome and had been terminated I early? I don't recall it in those terms, no. You don't? But, you know, you can clearly see that it, it, is, it has failed. So... Yeah. Well, there are failures and there are failures, aren't there? Yes, yeah, but it's part of the, um, the research then to make sure that, you know, the lines and the criteria that then follow in terms of the classification are such that these types of products right. can never pass the test. Whatever you do to them, they can never pass this test. Mm. But as you say, this was a, a research product and this was a product you'd never come across before. When you saw the results or heard about the test, did it not strike you? Did it not stick in your mind that this, this, this of all the products tested had a particularly noteworthy result? Yes, I mean, I would have um, noted that it had failed and it had failed, it failed early. Um, Yes. Now, this was a class naught product, wasn't it? Um, yes, I guess it was. It, yes, it was, and we have that elsewhere yes, in, the, yeah, it, it, yeah. in this document. It, 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 for our records, it's at page 11. Let's go to page, let's go to BRE uh, 3041911, please. Uh, and let's go to page 3 in it, which I think you've got, rain screen 3. Aluminium and ISO wool on metal, uh, and you've got the um, observations, the detailed observations from the PE cord aluminium rain screen cladding test, uh, and they're there starting at um, time zero, ignition of crib, and ending at seven minutes, front and wing faces extinguished. Uh, and you could see at five minutes, flame approximately twice height of rig, 20 meters. Do you remember seeing these results at the time? Um, I don't recall it, no. Do you know who recorded these observations? No, I don't. Looking up, it says that at three minutes and five seconds, molten aluminium drops off front face. Do, do you remember reading that particular observation? Um, I don't recall it, no. Um, and the, the person that would have recorded the um, observations would have been part of the project team undertaking mm -hmm. the test. When you had learned about this result, did you yourself consider that this was a significant, uh, a significant form of behaviour for a panel because of the potential for downward fire spread, the fire following the molten, dripping polyethylene? Yes, and, you know, as I said earlier, I mean, the whole point of this research project was to get to the point where we could ensure that products that performed badly would never, ever be able to pass the test. Looking at the results I've shown you and the chronology that I've shown you here, particularly at five minutes, the flames being approximately twice the height of the rig at 20 metres, did you conclude at the time that this was a catastrophic escalation? Um, well, yes, clearly it was not performing well in the, in the test scenario that we were using. Well, that's Fire note nine, yes. That's something of an understatement, isn't mm. it? I mean, it's an outlier, if you look at the other failures, to a very considerable degree. Sorry, you want me to...? Uh, do you agree with me that what you've just told us is something of an understatement, not performing well? It's an outlier, if you look at the other failures, to a very considerable degree, Dr Smith. Well, there were only three products that actually failed... Um, passed, sorry. Um, so an outlier, yes, it, it was very rapid in terms of its behaviour. Um, but I say it, it just, and it was part of the project to ensure that these products could never ever be used. Yes, and on that answer, so, does that does that? Sorry, go on. No, 
let, let, let me lead up to it. Do, mm. do you remember there being a sense of alarm at the BRE in the wake of this test about this product, which would lead to the conclusion you've just given us, that they should never, ever be used? Um, I, don't, I don't regard it as a sense of alarm. I mean, our role, of course, is to present the data and the results and, and the technical evidence. Um, I mean, yes. we, you know, you, you don't sort of react in, in quite the way that, that you're, you're suggesting, I don't think. Well, others did. The BRE, Sarah Colwell told us. She was shocked. Well, okay, well, that wasn't conveyed to me. Um, right. I mean, I, I would have looked at this report, I would have looked at the facts, and I would have looked at the way the facts were reported and would have ensured that what was reported was, um, you know, factually correct and supported. Hmm. Did you report to the department not just the facts, the scientific objective data, but the human reaction that your scientists conducting these tests had had? I would not have had that discussion with the department necessarily. I mean, that would have been had through the project team. I mean, Sarah and or um, Brian Martin would have had those discussions. You say they would have. Do you know whether they did? I don't know definitively, no, but I'd be very surprised if they didn't, especially if they were there and witnessed it. Wasn't it important to you, as the scientist, to drive home to the department, to Anthony Byrne, not just the data on a page, but what it might signify in human terms so that he, in government, could really understand the effect on real human lives in real buildings. I don't think there was ever any doubt in my mind that that was fully conveyed and that the department sort of didn't understand. I think the department were very aware. They were very aware. Now, the were they aware? Of, on the basis of you know, the, the, the research outcomes. Now, you told us in your evidence just a few moments ago that this test told you that this product should never, ever be used on a tall building. Correct. And that was your conclusion, and the BRE's conclusion was it from that test result? Yes. Do you remember yourself or anybody at the BRE conveying that information in those terms or in like terms to government? Um, in, in, a, in the broad sense, yes, that would have been conveyed in the sense that, you know, in the discussions about where the criteria would sit and were adopted, therefore, in BR135, those parameters are set to ensure that materials and systems of this type and, indeed, some of the others that also didn't perform well would not be acceptable within the context of the large-scale test method. Did anybody at the BRE or in government consider alerting industry or local authorities or building control or the NHBC or building owners to this result and its obvious danger to life? I don't know. You don't know? No, Can I, don't. I take it that the BRE didn't? No. We would not have done it. Would have been. I mean, we, we would convey the, the results and the data, etc., to the department, and then they would decide what to do with those right. data and results and whether to discuss it in a, in a wider sense. Um, so that that's the way that that right. that would be handled and did work. I see. C can we be just clear about one thing then? That f in. Your evidence to the inquiry is, is it, that from the middle of September 2002, to the best of your recollection, the government was in no doubt at all that ACM panels with a PE core should never, ever be used above 18 metres? Um, well, I can't say whether they took that all on board or not. I, I mean, you'll have to ask the department themselves as to what they actually, what their views were. I can't speak on behalf of what individuals' views no. were. I'm asking you to speak on your own behalf and on behalf of the BRE. My question, I'll put it again, 
Is it your evidence that from the middle of September 2002 to the best of your recollection as you saw it, the government was in no doubt at all that ACM panels with a polyethylene core should never ever be used above 18 metres? Well, I say, I, I, the bit that I can't accept is that the government had taken the view that they should not be used. I mean, I, I don't know that. All I can say, and as, as far as I can go, is that the results were reported within the context of the outputs from this project, and it was very clear what the results of those tests were, including ACM, but there were some other systems <coughs> as well, and that information was there, and there had been to my knowledge, discussions around those results and what they meant mm. and how to set the criteria there for in BR135 going forwards. Can were I you ask you this? Do, do you know if any steps were taken to draw the government's attention to this particular result, or was it simply left for it to find out for itself by reading the details of the report? Well all the way through these projects, I mean, there would be meetings, progress report meetings with, um, you know, departmental representatives. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you would have some fairly detailed presentations and feedback during those, um, which go beyond what was actually reported mm -hmm. in, in, in the reports. So I'm, you know, I have a high degree of expectation that that would have all been discussed during the, 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 the progress of the project, basically. Thank you. Let me just try this a slightly different way. Casting your mind back to September 2002, as, as best you recall it, were you in any doubt in your mind that the government understood, so far as you, could, you, you knew, the date that, that ACM panels with a polyethylene core should never, ever be used above 18 metres. Um, you well, can't speak for them, but you can speak no, for you. No, I can speak for myself. And I would say within the context of the work un being undertaken in relation to um, Fire Note 9 at the time. And the answer is yes. Within that context of Fire Note 9, yes. So the extent to which they were prepared to accept Fire Note 9 as being representative. Did this test performance of what was or what was said, I think, to be at least a Class 0 product make you think about whether Class 0 was an appropriate classification for the surface material or a product above 18 metres? I don't recall thinking about that specifically at the time. I mean, that wasn't the primary objective of this project. Um, so I, I don't recall thinking about that at the time. I, I can't, can't recall. Did it occur to you that the fact that a product achieved class naught, such as this product, was no guide at all to whether it would meet the functional requirement B41? The, whether it was a class O or not, class naught. Um, yes, I mean, insofar as I think we, the, the whole purpose of doing this project and doing the development work on Fire Note 9 was for that very reason to look at the, the performance of the system as a whole rather than looking at the performance of the individual elements within the system, which, you know, had we, um, Raymond Connolly's work had previously shown was not, you know, a reliable means for looking at the whole, the whole makeup of the external system. Well, well quite so. Uh, and that, that's why I asked the question, if nothing else, this test result would have told you, is this right, that class naught had now been empirically proved to be an utterly unreliable guide, at least in respect of this class naught project, to whether it would meet the functional requirement B41. Um, if used in absolute isolation, yes. If used in absolute isolation. 
Yes. If you just relied on, on, on that test alone. Which, of course, at the time was the linear route to compliance with ADB, wasn't it? Um, yeah, I can't recollect off the top of my head, but probably yes. Mr Chairman, is that a convenient moment? Yes, I think it is. Thank you very much. <clears throat> well, it's time we stop for lunch. Dr Smith, we'll break off there. We'll resume, please, at 2 o'clock. And uh, as before, please don't talk to anyone about your evidence while you're away from the room. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr Millett. 2 o'clock, please.